to the Freedom Factory's Creativity Unleashed podcast. Join me, Tiffany McIsaac, and my partner in creative pursuits, Melanie Pinto, as we explore creativity as a state of mind rather than a talent we're born with. Here you'll find guided meditations, insightful conversations, and evocative tools to help you unleash your full potential. Because when we live life from a place of creative thinking, the opportunities are endless. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode five of Creativity Unleashed. I can't believe we've done five episodes already. It's been such a pleasure bringing this podcast to you, something we've been really wanting to do for a while, and I've loved everyone's um, interaction and feedback. Um, So I really want to take this time and thank everyone so much for the support you've already given us so far. If you haven't already subscribed, please do share this with a friend, leave us a review in the comments. And yeah, in today's episode, we are so excited to be speaking with producer and actor Michael Musi, known for his role as Terrence on Kim's Convenience. This was honestly such a pleasure connecting with Michael. Not only is he such a talented artist, but a really, really genuinely wonderful guy. Tune in as he talks to us about the importance of networking and building authentic connections, getting out of your comfort zone and creating the roles that you really want to see yourself in, and most importantly, kindness. So enjoy the podcast. Hi, how's it going? I'm good. How are you? Good. Welcome to Creativity Unleashed. Um, Thank you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> so congratulations. You're having um, a ton of success right now working on television and movies and producing. Um, what is life like right now? What are you working on currently? I know we're all at home. <laughs> yeah, right now I'm working on like just trying to stay creative as much as possible. You know, I think um, when this all started, uh, I think we all, are all artists kind of put a lot of pressure on ourselves to say like we need to create because we're home and we have no excuse. Mm-hmm. But like, man, it was like so impossible for the first few weeks. Like I just was like, I don't, I don't want to, (laughs) I don't want to. And also like, this is all I'm thinking about. So unless I write a movie about the pandemic, I don't know what, you know what I mean? (laughs) And then something for me, I'm the type of person that like needs, you need to tell me that there's a deadline or else I won't do it. So as soon as uh, CBC uh, put out this like creative relief fund, uh, that was saying like, you know, for creators to kind of pitch their ideas and stuff like that. That's when I felt like someone was telling me I had to do something. And then that's when I started just kind of working. So, I mean, I've been working on like six different shows right now and just kind of writing and pitching. And so I'm feeling pretty good right now. You know, I'm feeling, um, I'm feeling like creative these days. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, but yeah, who knows, you know, like it's, it's always different. Every day is different. Is it something you were already um, working on for the pitch you're doing for CBC or was it a new idea? Yeah, a, a bit of both, like a, a bit of both. I have a, a writing partner who uh, we work together all the time. And so we are always working on projects and we always bring up ideas together. And then uh, most more times than not, we just don't go through with it. But it was one of those things where she kind of called me and we were like, oh, there's those things. Let's Let's work on those things. And now we were like, we really have no excuse. Let's just work on those things. And now trying to adjust it, being like, A, will will we don't know what the state of things will be. So, you know, what will social distancing look like in two months from now? Will it be just a looser version of this or will it be completely gone? I don't we don't know. Mm-hmm. So we had to kind of create shows that we can also be like, how can we shoot this if nothing were to change? And mm-hmm. and I can't even come to your house. How can we get these ideas done? Mm-hmm. So that was really kind of fun in ways to like be able to work and then call her up and be like, Oh my God, what if, what if this webcam thing here, or what if this and this goes here? And then, so that was really exciting Mm -hmm. to, to work on. But again, it's like, it's uh, the future is so unpredictable right now that it's hard to make kind of concrete plans about how you can shoot a thing. So I think right now what we're doing is just like putting all our options on the table and being like, when we know what things are, we can do this. And if things haven't changed, we'll do this. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I guess. Was that clear or did that just sound like (laughs) humbling? (laughs) It's it's interesting. I'm seeing for the first time 
social distancing and the pandemic being a reality on TV. And so like for the first time, I think we're getting to the point where, especially in, I guess, reality TV, yeah, content has run out and they're now getting the cast themselves to be filming stuff. So it's strange to actually see it reflected on TV. Well, I mean, it's one of those things that like, you know, I keep thinking, are we going to be talking about this in film and television or are we going to pretend this didn't happen? Mm-hmm. Because, because, and I don't know what the right answer is because we all need like something to escape to right now. Right. And I think we're not going to want to come out of this and have every show talk about the pandemic. I think, you know, we all, I think we would all like to move on to some degree. So, but, if, but at the same time, how do we not like, how do we pretend like, you know what I mean? We're all in this together. Yeah. So I think, and I think people take comfort in seeing like, um, uh, 90 day fiance has like 90 day fiance in quarantine or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I've been watching a lot of TLC. Don't judge. Um, and you know, and I'm just like, yeah, I think to some degree that comforts us in a way being like, yeah, we're all in this together. We're all figuring it out. American Idol is doing their auditions like via YouTube. Oh yeah. Uh, Not yet. Yeah. They're just like performing in their living room and you got to like vote for them. Mm-hmm. And it's like, yeah, I guess like, you know, it, it, if we're all in this together, that might as well reflect in the things that we're doing and we're all watching TV right now, you know? So I think it's kind of cool. And I also think it's really great to see the creative approach that people are taking yeah. to, to tell stories in this time. Yeah. You know? Because I yeah, think. Like that... talk shows. Yeah. Right. Like Jimmy Fallon is having like, you know, musical guests and interviews and stuff like that. And it's like, it's great. The mm-hmm. content is great. And it's, uh, it also shows us that, like, you know, you don't need much to tell a story, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. It's, uh, I think, like, the people that can actually, like, pivot with this will be the ones that are the most successful. I but guess, yeah. That's actually playing out in TV and the arts and... Yeah, yeah. I'm curious to see um, who's going to, you know, really, who like, what show is going to do that first, like, pandemic episode, you know? Mm-hmm. Like a lot, I'm sure it's like Law and Order or something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm into it. Speaking of shows, um, I think yeah. this one's going to be like a huge success when it finally drops. And I know that I don't have a Canadian Screen Award, um, mm. but myself and my business partner really want to get on I'll Clean Your Fridge. Oh. And oh. <laughs> we're hoping you can hook us up. <laughs> Listen, I, <laughs> I was like, where is she going with this? Uh, <laughs> um, I'm so obsessed with cleaning people's fridges. It's, uh, I think it's a, it's a real problem uh, because I just, when I go to someone's house for the first time and I, they open their fridge and it's really disorganized, I'm just like, oh my God. Like, how do I tell someone that I barely know that I just really want to freaking clean their fridge? <laughs> I don't know what it is. It's like, it's fridges and like cabinets, you know what I mean? But I'm not even that clean. Like, I'm not that, like, I don't care about my, my own fridge as much as I care about other people's <laughs> I just I love I love there's nothing more yeah, satisfying to be living orderly yeah <laughs> I know especially now when we get all our we get all our I'm staying right now at my sister's place with uh her three-year-old daughter and my brother-in-law yeah. and uh we've been doing the delivery uh groceries mm-hmm. but we're three people and you know and uh, my brother-in-law is also like very we have like um like a cold room downstairs where we like stock everything and stuff so he orders quite a bit of food and I'm just, a, every time it comes, I'm like, everyone get, literally get out of my way. I just want like <laughs> nobody near me and I just want to put, and then I, and then I'm just like the happiest person. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So yeah. If anyone wants to produce my show, I will go and <laughs> I will clean people's <laughs> fridges. I promise I will do it. And it will be a lot more fun than my story that I just told. <laughs> uh, yeah. It feels like comedy, um, comes easy to you I see that in a lot of the roles that you play does it actually or is it something like um for your characters that you have to work on um no it does come quite naturally to me more so than anything else I would say um it's it's funny right because you before it I I guess it's the case with most actors that before you can um decide for yourself what you think your forte is the industry already decides for you right like if that's already reflected in the auditions you get in the things that you book um so yeah i mean like when i went to theater school i was like i i always considered myself equal parts 
comedic and dramatic in my capabilities mm -hmm. but nobody cast me in drama like it was always in comedy and always and then you know the industry does this really kind of cruel thing where they kind of like tell you exactly what you look like in in the breakdowns that you get <laughs> you know what I mean so early on you get these breakdowns you get like your first when you're first starting on you get your audition and it's like really awkward nerdy guy and you're like oh that's fun and then you get 100 more and you're like I hear you. <laughs> I see what the camera sees now. But the good thing about that is that like, yes, comedy comes to me a lot more natural than other things, I guess, in a way. It's what I like to do the most. Mm -hmm. uh, it's what makes me the most happy. Um, and, you know, I feel like my, the things that I like to do the most and the things that I feel most comfortable doing match what the camera sees. Mm -hmm. I'm really good at playing really awkward, sweaty guys who, uh, who insert themselves in the conversation and nobody wants them there. And then he leaves. That's <laughs> just what I like. That's what I do best. So the fact that that's what the, you know, the fact that that's what Kim's convenience offered me, that's the role that that became. And that, that those are the things that I go out for. I feel very, um, I guess very fortunate because there's a lot of people who have that problem where they feel that what they do best isn't reflected in what the camera sees. Mm -hmm. You know, if someone wants to be a leading man, but he, the camera is not seeing that you're not going to get those parts, even though that's what you think you do best. It doesn't matter. Right. Mm -hmm. So I feel very lucky because even though I'm kind of pigeonholed in a way, um, it's what I really love to do. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. So yes, to answer your qu your question, comedy does come naturally <laughs> to me. I think. I think. Yeah. Do do the more serious roles like when you do play them or you um, go to take something like that on? Is that a struggle for you, or does it also just flow? No, I don't think it's a. I don't think it's a struggle when you get it. Like it's different because I'm a theater kid, right? So I grew up. I went to theater school, and I grew up in like not grew up, but the first things that I did was all theater. So I never really focused on television until a few years. I guess, I guess like the first, the first major thing I did, it was Kim's Convenience. But around that time is when I started booking, when we started working together. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that's when I started kind of getting more into TV. Um, and with theater, I mean, you have weeks and weeks and weeks to explore a character, right? So you, you can do all that work and then, you know, by the time it's opening night, you feel really prepared and ready to, to, to play the role. But with TV, you know, that's not how it works. You get an audition the night before and then the next day you got to play yeah. know, a criminal or whatever it is. So that's, um, that's a little, yeah, it is a little trickier. It's also tricky because especially for auditions, you, um, you're mostly trying to win the casting director over and you want to show them that you can do different things. Mm -hmm. So the thing that I not so much struggle with making, doing playing dramatic roles, but it's like, how do I shut off the thing that they already know about me? They mm -hmm. already know that I can come in and do the, the Terrence. Um, so how do I make those adjustments? What are little things that I can do in the next 12 hours that when I come in, that they'll look at my performance and say, Oh, he's really, he's really able to shift you know, and, and do different things. So yeah, it's a bit of a struggle, I would say, to some degree. But, um, you know, when, when I get the part, I do feel like I attack both things the same way. Um, and they're really fun to do, but they are at this point, because I've been doing the comedy thing for so long, they are a little intimidating mm -hmm. at times, you know, you're just kind of like, can I do this? Will like, will people be able to take me seriously? I even feel weird just taking off my glasses. You know what I mean? Like when I go to a room and just take off my glasses, I feel naked because mm -hmm. like, this is my thing. I'm this guy. This is who I am. Um, yeah. <laughs> or doing an accent, you know, uh, going in and doing that. It's, it, it's weird because you, I never thought that way in theater school, but in TV, um, because, because you, you get, like I said, kind of pigeonholed in a way you feel like, I feel like a little bit like a clown sometimes when I come in and I do something big and drastic and I'm like, please don't laugh. I'm like, please take this seriously. <laughs> you know? But also I come into rooms. I'm such a, like, you know, my character. So I just want to like come in and like make people laugh and have fun. And so, you know, when I come in for comedy auditions, I come in and I'm like, hey, what's going on, guys? And like, I'm all excited. And then when I come in for dramatic, I like, try to come in like a little bit, just like, yeah, this is, I could be this guy. If you wouldn't even be this guy, I'll be this guy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean, um, but I'd love to do them. Like, I love, I love when I get the opportunity. I haven't had many in the last 
a uh, couple of years, but yeah, I'd love to get back more into dramatic roles and whatnot. I really want to do a play. I really want to do a play. It's been so long. <laughs> writing any? Is that a part of any of your... Um, you know, I, what I do is I start writing plays and then I turn them into TV pilots mm -hmm. because, you know, um, it's just, theater's, theater's a hard thing to do. It, I mean, theater's easy to do because you can just do it. Mm -hmm. You know, you can just get a theater of 20 seats and put on a play if you want to. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, there's no money in theater. You know, and there's no, uh, there, it's so much work and build up to something that I feel is hard to really kind of make a living doing, you know? So I feel for the most part, while I'm writing, I'm like trying to find ways to make, turn it into TV. And if I can, I do. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. But yeah, I'm always like thinking of different play ideas and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you ever take part in like Fringe or anything like that? Yeah, I mean, I did a French play uh, two years ago, I think it was. Mm -hmm. two, two, yeah, two years ago, um, which was really cool because it was a character that was very unlike me, and it was at the same time that I was shooting season two or three of Kim's Comedians. Mm -hmm. So I was, I think it was season three. So I was often on set playing Terrence all day and then rushing to this, it was, a, it was in a bar, and I was playing a guy who died and he was at, when you die, uh, you're, you have a trial to, 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 and to weigh your heart to see if you're good or bad and if you're going to go into heaven or hell. Yeah. Um, and I, so, and it was, and, and, it, and it, the trial happens in the place that you have the most fondest memory. And mine was this bar that my dad uh, owned. And um, I had a really kind of complicated relationship with my dad. So he was in this bar. So we did it at the paddock uh, on Bathurst. Okay. And I would rush from playing like, you know, like Terrence all day. And then to go into this guy who's like this, like kind of really serious, like kind of fuck up. And, um, and that was like, that, that felt like acting school master class because it was, it was, a, it was, a, that was a hard adjustment to make because I was already in comedy mode mm -hmm. and switching over to, to, dram to dramatic mode. I thought would be e much easier, but I did have to like really take some time uh, like meditate in my Uber, you know, just be like, okay, shut that off, shut that off. Um, so yeah, so, so, but I would definitely do another, another French play if I could. It's just tricky because for us actors, I mean, as you can tell by the shows that you, the Canadian shows that you watch, like Kim's Convenience and Shit's Creek and all that stuff that shoots during the summer, you know? So that's when we're the busiest. So to take on, uh, something during fringe is a little hard, mm -hmm. uh, and like that, that play that I was talking about that happened at the paddock, the playwright had to, one day I just couldn't get off set. We were, we were just running behind and I couldn't make it to the play. And our, our director playwright had to go on for me. Oh, wow. <laughs> it was like, yeah. And it was apparently like he was freaking out, but he also, he said it was really fun, but he, he's not an actor, mm -hmm. but he was like, well, what are we going to do? We have, we have an, we have an audience mm -hmm. and I know this play better than anyone else. I guess I'm going on. Mm -hmm. And apparently he killed it, which is awesome. Uh, but I felt, I felt really horrible, but yeah, that's, you know, so I was like, I can't, when I thought about doing fringe the year after I was like, I, I think that's a really bad position to put a director in that I'm going to say like, maybe I won't make it to, to, to the play. <laughs> yeah. I don't think that's very nice. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting the way they're using so many interesting, um, like site specific venues. Yes. Yeah. I love that. I love that because it, you know, um, it gives you a, a um, it gives you a real reason to use your venue, you know, in a really creative way. And so I did a site specific play a few years ago called, um, and the reason why I did it, first of all, the reason why I did it was because I didn't get into regular fringe. So when you submit for fringe, it's lottery, right? And if you don't get it, you don't get it. But site specific is first come first serve if they approve you and your venue. Mm -hmm. So I did a play, which now during, during coronavirus sounds insane, but I did a play called The Doctor Will See You Now, which was in a doctor's, off, in a doctor's clinic. It was uh -huh. in a clinic in Spadina, which now like, they'd be like, never, you can never do, <laughs> you can never do uh -huh. that. But it was basically like our guests would come, they would wait in line, they would fill out forms like they were going to see, the, like they were going to a walk-in clinic and they'd sit in and there was a whole play happening surrounding them while these patients are being called into the doctor's office and getting diagnosed with different things and coming in and out. And it was a really creative 
um, thing to do. I thought it was really fun and the response was quite great, but we only could get like 30 people in, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in a day. Uh, we had like someone who was like a plant actor who was pretending to be an audience member and the audience only realized near the end, which was really successful the whole time. And, uh, it was great because we were like, we, we have to use our space. We can't have people come to a clinic and sit down to watch a play. Like they have to be like, that was worth it. You know, yeah. that was, you justify doing a play in a disgusting clinic, <laughs> clinic, you know? And, and so I think we did a good job at doing that, but it, there's, there's that extra challenge that makes it super fun. Like, how can we use that really creepy room in the corner that I didn't know about when I booked yeah. this space, you know? Um, so yeah, I love that. I love that. They, they've done plays in buses, you know, uh, um, what other venues? They've done boxing gyms, mm. you know. Has anyone ever done uh, a play at your space? Yeah, I think probably cool. also two years ago, um, we did... Um, we did a play that was based in an art gallery. So they reached out to oh, us. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so basically one artist, this gallery is closing. It's their final show. Uh -huh. And one artist gets upset that another has sold what they deem to be um, non-worthy art. And yet their art hasn't sold. Um, uh, oh, cool. Interesting because it is a topic that comes up a lot. <laughs> Um, sort of artists judging each other's work and who uh, who's a real artist and who's not a real artist. So it was yeah. really nice to get to like watch these actors delve into something that we um, hear people talking about all the time. For sure. Um, but it was cool because we got to, so basically this um, character trashes the gallery and the place. The that, gallery. So we, <laughs> uh, we had a lot of artists like create art for this show. So we hung a show to be the set. So then we put in like destroyed prop art at the same oh time. Oh boy, okay. So that was fun actually getting to like punch all the paintings and um, yeah. work in sculpture and- That's really fun. Yeah. And the response was good? It was really good. And I yeah. think it's like, obviously the experience is gonna be better whether it's a gallery or a clinic or a bar when you're like immersed in the story. For sure. Yeah, for sure. And when, and when you feel, yeah, when you just feel like you're not watching a play and you're just, it's an experience, right? Mm -hmm. like it's like when people lost their minds with that show, what was that show in New York that it was like in a mansion and they would like go around uh, in different rooms and you had to wear masks. Do you know what I'm talking about? No. Sleep no more. Okay. Have you ever heard of that? It was like a, like a retelling of Macbeth and it was like in this like, mm -hmm old hotel or something and you get in and you all wore masks and it was like everyone had a different experience because plays were happening in different rooms but sometimes the actors would like pull you in a closet and be like you need to find my locket or whatever mm -hmm. and um so sometimes people would come out and be like nothing happened and sometimes people would be like yo that was messed up like someone took me in this room and they told me to go find this and then i couldn't find it and then i saw someone kill themselves and you're like so that's like so so and that's like i guess the original like not escape room, but like that whole like mystery. immersive, yeah, mystery yeah. thing. Um, I'm into it. Mm -hmm. I'm into it. I'm into it. But sometimes I feel like you know what's so funny is like as as an actor, but also the other actors that I know, we hate. Like I hate being like close in an audience where people can see my face. Like I don't like being watched unless I'm on stage. Mm -hmm. So that does make me a little bit nervous too, where I'm like, okay, at least you have a mask, but I kind of like, I, that kind of freaks me out a little bit. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, when people get like, I, if, if someone were to pick on me at a standup show, it's like, that's like my nightmare. Yeah. And I don't know why. Cause like, I don't, <laughs> you know what I mean? That's so out of character for me. Comedian. But I'm just like, I'm, I'm sitting down now. Don't talk to yeah. me. <laughs> don't this is not what i signed up for yeah i always sit at the back of comedy shows i know oh, me too i, I love going but i have that fear i know because also it's like they're never going to be like they literally just point out the things that are obvious to them which are like i don't want you to like just point at my flaws <laughs> you know what i mean that doesn't sound like fun for me i got i came out tonight to have fun you're like that sounds like an audition i don't know <laughs> That sounds like, yeah, that sounds like work and I don't want to work right now. Yeah. It's, um, it's, you know, 
I always say with visual art, I'm lucky because you get to perfect something and then put it out there and you're sort of in control of the whole process as far as like how exposed you are and what you let people in on and what you let people see and how you present it. Music sort of somewhere in the middle, acting, um, getting the roles and everything. You're so vulnerable. You're being judged right in the moment. But also like you've been talking about, it has to do with things like how you look um, versus just the art and the expression like how do you deal with that um i guess you just i mean you have to accept it It, 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 it's it's part of our industry and it's it is what it is we do it all the time you know we see someone and we make a judgment call of who they are and you know a lot of times people surprise us and um when you get to a certain place in your career, you can get a little bit more liberty to play other roles and people will accept that. Mm -hmm. But in the beginning, especially when you're starting out, like you got to accept what that is, even if it sucks or even if it's not what you want it to be, you know, um, like I, it would, I grew, when I went to school in New York, my best friend, he was, um, this like incredibly handsome, built dude he's like now one of the new um old spice guys in the states he lives in la so that's what he looks like um and him and i were best friends and he's like super into comic books and like really into video games and stuff like that and i don't play video games i don't like comic books and i and when i was in new york i wanted to go out and have fun and all that stuff and people were always so shocked because we were it was almost like we should have switched bodies. Um, but he was always like, he was like, I want to play the comedic relief. That's all I want to do is I want to play. You get the fondest parts. You're so lucky. And the teachers would always cast him as the really handsome lead who gets the girl and sweeps her off her feet and whatever. And he was like, that's not who I am. Like that doesn't match who I am, Mm -hmm. but there's nothing to, there's nothing you can do about that unless you create your own work. Mm -hmm. Right. Like you can, or you have a friend or, uh, you know, a producer that's willing to take that chance, but especially in TV, like it sees it, like the camera knows what it wants. And if that's what it wants from you, you know, you got to That's what you got to do. And casting directors, you know, they're doing their jobs. And when a, when a producer tells them, get me five people who can play this really nerdy tech guy mm-hmm. who is really sweaty and um, can't talk to women they're going to call me in. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, 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 if, and, if they, and if they call me in for that role, I have to, to deliver, you know, and the, the thing, like I said, for me, I'm really lucky because I actually really love doing those things and it is what I do best. Um, but I'm not getting calls to play the handsome lead who gets the girl. I've never had an audition where I got the girl. You know what I mean? <laughs> that's not like, I've never been that guy. And that's, that's okay to me. That's okay. Um, it's not okay to a lot of people that they, they really, they, they, they don't feel as comfortable as I do getting the roles that I, that I get to play. Um, and it sucks. Mm-hmm. And it sucks. And that's why you create your own work or you take, you, you, you know, you make, you have a friend that creates their work and you get them to cast you in a thing or you shoot a short film that shows a different side of you. I just edited my new demo reel. Um, and, uh, I was going back and forth with my agent about it and he was like, do we have anything a little bit more dramatic that we could show? And I was like, no, (laughs) like, no, we don't, we don't. And so now I know that the next thing that I film, if I want to do a short film or something, I have to show that side to me because nobody is paying me to do that yet. Mm -hmm. Um, And until they do, uh, I won't have, I won't have a way of showing that to them. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone's working on a limit on a time, um, on a time constraint to get things done. Casting directors are have to cast 90 um, roles in a film. They're not going to be like, let's see if, you know, Michael Moosey can come in and really knock the socks out of us playing, you know, the hero. They're, they're like, we got to cast these things and we're going to get this person who we know can do this and this person who could do this. And, and so, yeah, I, I mean, some, I, I think it can really, um, it can get tiring or a little old, doing the same thing all the time but i mean i'm still pretty young so i haven't felt that yet i'm just so thankful when i get to work and when i get to audition for really cool things um but yeah i would love like yeah i would love to to be able to do other things and explore those things and um you know i totally went off subject with what you were asking me but 
here we are. No, that's great. <laughs> here we are. How yeah. much, um, I guess, creative control do you have over your own characters? Like, yeah, like when I when I'm on set. Yeah. Well, with Kim's convenience, um, a lot and a, the, a lot, but not really. It, it's it's a tricky question because the thing is, is that my 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 situation was very specific because I was hired to play uh, Terrence, which was one episode, and I had one word, and that's all the audition was. Wow. And I started working at our restaurant that we were working at when we met, mm -hmm. and uh, I had wine training that night. And it was the first wine training and I was desperate for work. And I uh, got this audition for Kim's Convenience. And I, um, I saw the audition and it was for one word, one episode. My line was, hey. So I was like, I, was like, I, can't, I can't skip out on wine training to go audition to say, hey. Like, I, I don't know if that's worth it for me right now. I need money and I need to have a job. Mm -hmm. So I called my agent and I was like, I don't know what to do. I'm a little, you know, and she was like, can you go earlier? They said, maybe they'll try and see you. And I said, sure. So I went in and then they gave me, um, they gave me another line. Uh, and then I booked it and I found out it was two episodes. And I was like, yeah. And then they just kept kind of calling me in and calling me in until it became what it became. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't think that they really knew what this guy was because they weren't ever planning on having him be a series regular on the show. Mm -hmm. So I think we figured it out together. I think, you know, through the scripts and all these things, we were, you know, we were able to see, okay, he's kind of like this and he's kind of like that. But um, when I was on set, I didn't really know who he was myself. So I had to kind of figure it out. And so, you know, I would just not, we wouldn't so much talk about it. I would just, offer things mm -hmm. and I'd be like you know I'd do it one way and I'd be like hey I'm gonna try it this way is that cool and our directors are awesome we have like four directors a year that does that do different blocks and they've always been like yeah and if it doesn't work then we'll go back to what we were doing before right um and uh so with him yeah with Terrence it was a lot of like me just trying things and like playing around and trying this and then just being like, what if you were to do this or, you know, and then every once in a while you get a script that says something so small that makes so much sense where he's like, you know, I can't hang out today. I'm like playing checkers with my mom. And you're like, okay, that makes sense. So that goes into the, okay, this is, this is the type of guy he is. This yeah. is the relationship he has with his mother. This is, you know, and then all that stuff influence you until you feel pretty comfortable with who this person is. And now, you know, we're when the time is right, we're going to be going back to season five and now we all know who this person is, but it did take a lot of like building together to kind of realize and who he was. And yeah, I don't know if someone else got the part, would, would he be very different? Maybe. Um, but I definitely never felt like I was stuck in a thing. I always felt like I had room to play and discover with them. And that's mm -hmm. been the funnest part of it mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. It's good too. So you have to play the role to like the role you're playing. So to be able to have that. Yeah. Yeah, you gotta like like you gotta like the guy, you know. You gotta like who he is, and you gotta kind of fall in love with this person and accept him for the things that you don't really agree with and mm -hmm. and stuff. Like, who is I? Who am I thinking of right now that was talking about? Oh, um, um, the character Tahani in Good Place. Have you seen Good Place? No. So she's there's this character named Tahani, and she's like this like beautiful model who's just like you know. Um, her, she's kind of like Alexis in Schitt's Creek. Like she's just always like, oh, when I was on the yacht with Brad Pitt and all this stuff. And she's like, I've raised millions and millions for charities and all that stuff. And the actress who played her was talking about how like she didn't really like her in the beginning. And she had to play this character that she didn't like. And she hated the things that came out of her. And now she loves her because she started to see her insecurities and where this was coming from and, you know, all that. But I think it's so important to like the person you're playing, even if you don't agree with them. You have to find like the humanity in them uh, and you have to find the reasoning for the things that they do. And again, we don't make up our dialogue. So when someone gives me a script and, and my character says something that is a little like, oh, I didn't know he would do that thing. You have to, your job as the actor is to justify it. Mm -hmm. Like, why would he say that? You know, what, how do I make that? And, and to me, like, 
when I go back and watch my work and I see things that I said that I didn't fully understand why he would or stuff like that. It's I'm always, I always watch it. And I'm like, Oh, bad. Like it's cringy to me, not necessarily with Kim's convenience, but with, with things in general. Um, but then when I do the work and I like find the reason why that's why I say that thing and why my character would do that thing, then it just feels so much more natural. It feels like a full character. Um, but yeah, that's like, that's, I mean, that's part of the job, right? Mm-hmm. Is like, we don't, we're all figuring out who this person is. We don't know everything about this person. You know, you see characters, your favorite characters, and all of a sudden, you know, season four, you find out that their parents are dead, you know, or whatever it is. And that's a huge thing to, to read and be like, oh, you know, and then sometimes you get a thing and you're like, oh my God, well then why did I do this in season two? Like, why did I play it this way or whatever? But but then you justify it. And if you justify it, if you do the work and you justify it, then then we're all in it together and we can create something that makes sense. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Long and I'm all about the long answers. This Don't you wish we could all do that with each other? Uh-huh. Like give each other the benefit of the debt that we don't know those things. Yeah. Oh. And that's sometimes, sometimes that thing that I did that you thought was really weird. I, I think it's weird too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I did that either. <laughs> So let's just figure it out or let's just move on. Yeah, of course. Right? Like sometimes I think that all the time. Like I'm so, like, I do things sometimes that are so out of character that you're like, where did that come from? And it's like, oh, yeah, we're all capable of everything. We all have so many different sides of us, you know? And so, and, but we, but we love to judge TV characters that yeah. way. Like, oh, that person do that. It's whatever. It's like, we're all just, <laughs> we're all figuring it out. Give us all a break. Do you, you find know? people are treating you in real life like your character? Um, like, um, like if I see, like, say that again? Even like strangers, do they approach you like your Taryn? Yeah, I would say those are the only people that treat me that way. Is people that are fans of our show that would see me and be like, oh my God. And then they would be, and then they would talk to me like I am like I am Terrence, yeah. which I get, you've never met me. This is who you think I am. Yeah. Um, but uh, certainly not like my family or my yeah. friends, um, even though there's like a lot of this guy that is pretty close to who I am. Mm-hmm. Um, like I am often really awkward. Like that's, <laughs> you know what I mean? I do come into conversations at the wrong time. Uh, and so, so, and my sister sometimes will like say, I'll say something and she's like, God, that was so Terrence. <laughs> you know? I'll get that a lot. All right, you know, there's um, there's something that uh, me and my friend Nicole, who's on the show, uh, we're really close friends, and it, I don't remember what scene it was, but like Terrence does this thing a couple of times where he just goes like, "Huh," when he was like thinking about something, and then I do that in real life now all the time too, and she'll just kind of shoot me a look. I'm like, "Damn it!" <laughs> like I'm becoming, you know what I mean? Like we morph. Sometimes we just morph into our characters a little bit, especially when we're playing him a lot. Like when I'm playing him a lot in the summer. Yeah, sometimes it's hard to like shut it off. You know, you're just like, I'm just like extra awkward and sweaty in the summer. I love the like restaurant tampon scene between you and her. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that's from one of the shows that I uh, pitched um, a little while back called Hogtown that I'm trying, still trying to work on. Uh, yeah, that was really fun. That was, it, that's in her um, fiance's restaurant. Mm-hmm. Uh, he owns a, a restaurant called Rasa in Toronto. And uh, we shot it there. Uh, it was just one of those things where like, you know, let's just do this. Let's just freaking do it. We'll do it. We'll do it. We'll do it. So we went in and we shot it. And, um, uh, his like staff was there opening up. We had like 30 minutes to shoot this scene. And luckily because Nicole and I worked together for so long, it was, it was, we felt really comfortable. We were able to do it. Um, and, uh, yeah. And it was like so much fun. I'm really happy with that. And I, uh, I really hope I can make that show at some point. Mm. Yeah. It's funny. I- I've met her actually at Rasa. Yeah, because she worked at Soul Pepper forever. Yeah. Yeah. I, oh, 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 you're saying you met her at Rasa. Yeah. 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 She's. I wasn't sure oh. if it was the same, if I was just recognizing her from TV or from that day. But now that you say that, it's like, oh, yeah, that is where I actually met her. Yeah. But she also, when we worked at, at Clooney, she, she was at Soul Pepper all the time. So she was always in. Okay. So you probably also saw her a lot there. But yeah, I mean, she's, she's, you know, obviously her, her fiance own, uh, owns a place, but she also like helps him out when he needs some help. And she also, we also really like, we, we go there all the time to yeah. eat. It's, it's 
so good. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it was fun. It was, it was fun. It was fun shooting uh, in the restaurant and um, also fun kind of like beating the clock and trying to shoot in like half an hour and just being like, let's get this done. And then seeing the final product and being like, yeah, that kind of worked, you know, and yeah. just, it, it just, it, that whole experience made me prove to me that like, you can just do it. Mm-hmm. You know, it doesn't have to be elaborate. Like, you know, you know, we, that cost us, we shot three big scenes, one in a restaurant, one in a, in a boardroom and one in an apartment, you know, got it colored and edited and all that stuff. And it cost us just like a couple of thousand dollars because we called in all the favors mm-hmm. and we did things in very um, cheap ways and things like that. And so I'm like, yeah, you can just really do it and you never know what it will lead to. I did the same with a food show. I shot a food show in Montreal uh, over the holidays that's being edited right now that I'm also pitching. Um, and it was like, I was just like, I want to do something. And so I called in favors. I, you know, I got whatever. And for like two days, I shot this food show that I'm super proud of. Mm -hmm. And, um, and every time you do that, you just become better at it, you know, and you, and you make connections and you meet a sound guy who, you know, like my director for that came on board and directed it and got me all this equipment and all that stuff. But, you know, a year before I produced one of his short films and brought down a cast from Toronto. And it's like, we help, we've helped each other out and we're only able to do this for cheap because we're doing favors for each other. Mm-hmm. And when you start to build that community, you can start to do that and get away with it. Um, Tiffany, do you mind if I go blow my nose really yeah, quick? Sure. <laughs> pause, pause, pause uh, uh, video. Mm-hmm. Um, it's interesting, like always the hospitality industry is so small. Yeah. Um, I'm sure in every city, but especially in Toronto and you hear so many people like, Oh, we work together here. We work together there. How, um, how much has it influenced you in your art? Like do you pull on experiences? Um, and then also like networking and connections and. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, is like, I'm so thankful for that. The fact that artists can do something that works with our schedule and we can make a decent living doing it. I mean, I've been bartending, you know, ever since I was in school in New York when I was 19 years old, you know what I mean? Like that has been a way that I've made money forever. And I haven't done it for a, a few years because I've been able to support myself as an artist, which is amazing. But I know I'm not like shutting off the fact that I might have to go back at some point. And like, and I'm totally cool with that, to be honest. Like I, first of all, I really like bartending. I really enjoy it. But also, yeah, like, you know, the people that you meet are incredible uh, because it's a lot of artists who do it. Like, you know, this job obviously attracts a lot of artists and I've made some of my best friends in this industry. Mm -hmm. Um, and also the most funniest, weirdest crap has happened to me in, <laughs> you know what I mean? So Hogtown, that show that we were just talking about, um, that was like a collection of creating, creating that show is like a collection of stories between me and Maddie, who's also been in hospitality forever. Um, because my character is a chef. And, um, so creating that whole season outline for it, it's just stories from our own experiences. Mm -hmm. Um, But more importantly, you know, hospitality has been a place where you can stress-free do your art and then have a job that's at night that you can go to and make a living. And it's, um, yeah, I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful for it because it's a thing that at the end of the day, when I start to stress out and be like, I'm unhirable. No one's going to want to hire me again. I'm a bad actor. I'm not funny. And whenever I have those things that go on in my head, I know that I'll always have a job if I want to have a job. You know what I mean? And that's pretty fantastic mm-hmm. that we, that I have that. Mm-hmm. That I know that I will find a place that will hire me and I can make cocktails and I won't hate my life. Yeah. You know? that. I, that so, yeah, I'm really thankful for it. And, um, and like you said, like there's so many people that do it, like so many artists that do it. So it's usually quite fun, mm-hmm. you know, like I know, like we, we had a really good thing going. I, I, was, I wasn't there for very long because I actually booked Kim's, yeah, I booked Kim's convenience yeah. when I started there. 
But um, just those few months, I was like, I saw like the community in that restaurant was pretty strong and powerful and people would just hang out after all the time and stuff like that. And I had never been a part of something that big. I had always worked at like tiny little, um, I did a lot of like, uh, theaters, like I, um, like, uh, off Broadway theaters in New York and stuff like that, where I would bartend or a little cocktail bar in Toronto and things like that. I'd never done a big restaurant like that. And it was really like a band of people who really loved each other. And when someone like quit or whatever, everyone was so sad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was really cool. You worked there with Chef Paul, right? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I've been listening, Chef Paul Benelik, um, yeah, he was like really like such an example to me of how one person can create an entire environment. For sure. For sure. And he was so um, like passionate about what he did and like, and you know, a lot of times when you don't really care about the job, you can just show up and kind of like do your thing. And you're like, I just want to make some cash and leave. Um, but he would, he put so much uh, emphasis on what, um, you know, giving about giving these people an experience and, you know, especially during summer licious, like that speech that he always had about like, you know, this is a time that people can't always afford to come to our restaurant and now they can. And even though they're spending $35 on dinner or whatever it is, that's a lot for some people. And uh, they deserve to be given the same experience that the person who's dishing out a thousand dollars, which is so freaking lovely, you yeah. know? And, um, and it just makes you think like, yeah, you know what I'm doing does matter. Giving people an experience does matter. Also, we worked in the distillery district, so it was all tourists. We know what it's like to go to a new city and to have a really shitty experience and just be like, is this what the city is? You know <laughs> what I mean? Is, is this who the people are? Mm -hmm. And so giving people that kind of a, that experience and, um, and feeling like there's more to your job than just, you know, making 1 million mimosas for brunch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that I don't miss. I yeah. don't miss mimosas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't miss brunch, period. Period. Unless I'm period. going to it. I agree. Yeah. I agree. But when I go to brunch now, I'm just like, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, everyone. <laughs> thank you. I'm so appreciative because I'm like, none of you want to be doing this right now. Yeah. Brunch is not an easy, it's not an easy no. show. It's not an easy show. Brunch with your girlfriends. Like the second it was brunch, the like volume pitch in the room just I, like, <laughs> babies and girlfriends who hadn't seen each other in a long time. I know, I know. Hey, it was like oh it was really high. Yeah. And uh and that's the thing is like people love it. It's like early we're, we have to be there so early and mm -hmm. people are like <laughs> like you said like people are having the best time. I love going to brunch. People are having the best time and we're just like whew that was a hard one. That was that was a hard one. Except but, Paul um, would make us the biggest feast at the end. I know. We oh, actually got man. like the best brunch. We had the best food at that restaurant. They would he would make us such good food. We had it really good. He came to a creative, um, like a creativity meditation workshop that we did. Oh, cool! And um, it's basically like we did like a Reiki views meditation, and then you had to start painting or go into some kind of expression, and I. I looked at what he had was drawing afterwards and um, it was like a kind of a funny looking picture. And it was sort of like, Oh, that's nice. Like, what did you draw? And he's like, no, it's a plate. And he was like mapping out food and had oh. with, like a whole menu idea. And so it's really cool to see him like in that element as an artist expressing himself after a meditation. For sure. Yeah. I mean, that's his art, right? That's like how that's how he expresses himself. He loved making even our staff meals. He was like, you would just see him watching us in the corner, right? He loved like that was his way of expressing mm -hmm. himself. That's awesome. It's nice too because we have like a staff of a bunch of visual artists, actors, um, and creatives. And then even though it's a restaurant, not necessarily everyone's field, your boss ultimately is also an artist. Right. For him to be able to actually connect with everyone. Yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. That's really cool. And uh, we, at that restaurant in particular, we, we were quite a few artists, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it was great. It was, uh, now I miss it. <laughs> <laughs> I, miss it now. Uh, I, I think I just miss people. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? I miss the outside. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, how does it feel to be a part of such a iconic Canadian TV show? Yeah. I mean, if, if, I, I love this show um, and I love the people behind the show and I um, 
there's nothing I like doing more than being on that set. Uh, and so you don't, when you're doing, when you're shooting the show, you don't really think about how it's going to be on TV and stuff. You know what I mean? Like you don't really think about the after you think about like what's happening in the moment. So the fact that my experience in the moment is so positive and then the world is appreciating it in such a strong way. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's now, you know, on Netflix international. And so we get all these messages from people who are really digging our show. And when you're doing it, you don't, you forget that people will see it. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that people are loving the show and really appreciating it and, and kind of digging what we're giving them and we're having the best time doing it mm -hmm. is truly the best thing you can ever hope for as an actor or as a, you know, a writer or anything like that. Um, it's such a heartfelt good show. It just means so the show means so well, it, it just is like a warm hug. Mm -hmm. And um, during a time like this, where people are at home and they just want to watch something that makes them feel good. Yeah. Um, getting those messages of people just being like, you know, that your show is the only thing that's like keeping me smiling and positive and I, and what you guys are doing is so awesome. That's like, what more can you ask? You know? Um, so yeah, I feel insanely lucky. I feel really lucky that my character became what it has become um, and that it grew in this way. Cause that is also the dream. You know, when I auditioned for the show, I didn't have much on my resume and I would never at that point, I don't think at least have been offered a series regular on a TV show. Cause I don't think that I had enough experience. So the fact that I was able to book an, uh, one episode that turned into two, that turned into seven, that turned into 40 or whatever it is now, um, is such a gift like that's so and it's so unheard of it's the thing that people tell you that might happen but you, you don't think it'll ever happen but it did happen um and yeah i mean i'm so i'm so proud to, to tell people that i'm on that show i'm so happy when people recognize me for that show um because i really think we're doing something really good mm -hmm. yeah um how is it sort of like switching between acting and producing um I, lo I love both I love both I didn't know I would love producing I fell into producing kind of in a in a weird way um I had produced like short films and things like that but the first major thing I produced was a horror film that we shot um fall of 2018 so about a year and a half ago ish and um the reason why I was asked to produce it was because my friends um, got this uh, uh, private invest uh, private investors gave, gave them money to create this short uh, this uh, feature film, and they're my buddies who we work together. We produce short films together and stuff like that. And they just like me. Mm -hmm. They didn't they they didn't know that I was capable of producing, but they just wanted me around, and so they asked if I would do it. Um, and I felt really. Um, you know, weighing over my head about it because I was like, I've never um, produced anything mm -hmm. this scale before. And here I am like casting all these really good actors who are coming out to the country. We shot in a forest, like in the, in the middle of nowhere um, with all these people. And then uh, we shot night shoots. So it was like, we would start at like set 6 p.m. and we would wrap at like, I would be like one of the last per people in bed because I had to make sure everything was kind of good to go. And I'd go to bed at like 8 a.m. And then, but you know, while you're producing also during the day is when businesses are open and that's when you're dealing with people. So I felt like for like three weeks while we shot, I got like an average of like one to two hours of sleep. There was so much to do. It was so overwhelming. There were so many times where I pretended I had to go get something and I cried in my room. Uh. Uh, cause I was so overwhelmed and I felt like I was letting people down because I didn't know what I was doing. Mm -hmm. But then when I talked to people, I realized that like that never came across mm -hmm. and that, that they felt really secure in what they were doing because I felt like, because I gave them the impression that things were good and okay. And then I realized that was a skill of mine. Mm -hmm. And then I loved that because I like as an actor knowing that, um, you know, what we're doing is good and that um, I'm doing enough and all that stuff. And to be able to give that to other actors and to the crew and when they had a problem that they all felt like they can come to me and talk about it and we can solve it together. And um, I was like, this is a whole new thing that I never wanted to get into really. And now I love it almost as much as I love acting. Mm -hmm. um, it's so much harder. 
<laughs> like it's so much harder um, to, for me, at least and that that doesn't come natural. I'm not a naturally very organized person too. So like really turning that on was, was a bit tricky, but also it was an independent film and we had, you know, uh, we had a budget to, to, to do this, but we also were all pretty new to the game that we were so scared of running out of money or overspending or a massive problem coming our way. And then that would eat a huge part of our budget. So we tried to do everything on our own. Mm -hmm. So I was producer, casting director, craft services, um, you know, uh, 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 locations manager. I like did so many, I wore so many hats. Mm -hmm. Uh, So that was like, that was film, film school, you know, for sure. Like that was the best uh, education I could have gotten. Um, and I loved it. I loved it. I loved it. Especially after during the, while doing it, I was like, I was really overwhelmed, but afterwards seeing the film, I never felt that gratification from seeing my work, even though I wasn't to be seen on that camera at all. And I had very little creative input, Mm -hmm. but seeing that afterwards being like, I helped make this massive thing in such a different way. Mm. I was like hooked. And so now, you know, I'm writing and I'm doing all these things because I really want to produce my own stuff. I really want to have that control and I really want to be able to set the tone for, uh, for a production because I feel like it is something that I'm really good at. And I didn't know I was really good at it. So, so that's really Especially cool. if you're having a creative say in it as well, like that yeah. be even impacted. For sure. For sure. Cause even those little, like I did have some creative input and, um, uh, the main actress, Jordan, who's my really good friend, she would often come to me for acting and like acting input and stuff. And, you know, she was like producing, she was, she was, she was like the biggest hero on that set. She was producing, um, doing everything else and was pregnant Mm -hmm. Um, and was main actor of this film running around falling on the ground. Like, you know what I mean? Like she was like crying the whole time. Like she, what she was doing was incredible. And so a lot of times, you know, what, what, like at six in the morning when she's completely drained, she'd be like, I have to do this big scene and I don't know how to get here. So I would take her aside and we would do some work together to get her to that place and seeing those scenes and seeing kind of what she did and how we were able to come up with things together was really um, satisfying. And it felt really cool to have that, that input. So yeah, I really love producing um, and I want to do more of it in different ways. What kinds of things do you do to get there in those moments when you don't know how to get to that emotion or get to that? You know what? It's really, that's really tricky because I think everyone has different things that help, you know, like there are, like to give you an example, I, um, there's this amazing actress in Toronto. Um, her name is Claire Armstrong. She's um, a theater actor. Mostly. She also does a lot of uh, TV and film. She's one of the best actors. I think she's incredible. And I did a play with her and she in her rehearsal process is like the type of actor that like can't, can't move on until she knows exactly what she's doing. She needs to find an answer for everything. Why would I do that? Why this? Why this? And in rehearsal, it's like three weeks of her just being like every little thing she has to work on. But then by the time she opens, she's already done all the work. Mm-hmm. So night after night, her, her performance is incredible and she's not putting in the work because the work has already been done. Mm -hmm. I'm not like that. (laughs) I can't work that way. So I have to work in a way that's like, how do I keep this fresh? So, you know, how do I, how do I um, stay in the moment? How do I work on things that can get me there every night? I can't do the work and then forget about it. And it's just like live in my body. It doesn't work like that for me. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in that same play that we did together where Claire had done all the work and she was feeling amazing and she was able to go on and give a performance. I was in the corner with my music, you know, I, uh, you know, thinking about things that would help me get into that emotional state that I needed to get to. Um, and for her, she didn't need to do that. Mm -hmm. So everyone is different. Everyone has a different approach on what they need in moments where you really need to, um, get somewhere emotionally Mm -hmm. for me this sounds really horrible but it's the truth is the way that I get somewhere is by if I don't have the time is by faking it until it it becomes real you know what I mean like 
sometimes you just got to fake it. You got to fake, you got to do it. So you got to fake it. And a lot of times, more times than not, because as artists, we're very sensitive and, you know, and we're, we can access those emotion, emotions quite quickly. When we start to fake it and we start to feel those things, they come. Yeah. So sometimes you just got to start it. You know what I mean? You just got to like, okay, this is going to be a shit take right now. It's going to be really garbage, but I'm going to try and fake cry or I'm going to try and fake scream or pretend to be really scared. And then eventually you, more times than not, you just get there naturally. Yeah. And then no, and then that first take goes straight in the garbage and uh, they yeah. use something later on, you know? Um, so yeah, it was a lot of that. It was a lot of just like, you know, okay, where are we right now? We shoot on movies and TV, we shoot out of order, right? So, you know, on the first day of set, you're shooting a scene where you run away from the killer. And then on the seventh day, you shoot the opening scene where you're like, my life is amazing, you know? And so you have to be prepared to be kind of all over and you have to be able to map out your journey, mm-hmm. you know, and be like, right. Okay. So this just happened. My mom just called and told me that she's leaving my dad. And then I'm, I'm making up the story, by the way, <laughs> you know, my mom just called and said, I'm leaving my dad. And I just found out that <clears throat> my car broke down and I can't get to, you know, you got to like be able to, okay, where am I? Okay. Right. Think about the circumstance and then, do it i guess you know um yeah why is that why is it all shot out of order for a few reasons but mostly for locations Mm -hmm. so you know like for example um on kim's convenience we shoot two episodes at the same time and then we'll shoot um so say for example in episode three and episode six we're shooting those two episodes and in two of those episodes um there are three scenes in total that are in Shannon's office. Mm -hmm. So instead of going from lighting different rooms, because it takes a while to light a set a certain way and to get that set ready. So instead of going back and forth, we shoot all the things that are in that office. Mm -hmm. So whether it's the first episode of episode three or the last episode of episode six, we shoot all of them. So Mm -hmm. we'll shoot, we'll, we'll block, we'll shoot. And then, well, everyone will go change back into that outfit from the other episode. I'm very lucky because I only wear a blue polo, but Nicole is like in all these beautiful dresses and stuff. So she's like constantly up and down the stairs changing into different outfits, but it's just because it's so much work to light and shift the set. Mm -hmm. So for us with like the horror movie, yeah, we shot all the stuff that was in one location of the woods because we're bringing massive pieces of equipment into the woods, mm-hmm. you know, so it's, we can't just keep going back and forth. So that's the main, the main reason. Hmm. Yeah. It's so like important to like be able to tap into that creative flow then because you're like, when you watch a movie, yeah, you think that there's that build up of, but it's not, you have to be able to just like, jump yeah. It. Yeah. It's so not what people think like I think everyone just assumes that we shoot an order and it's like this you know whatever and it's it's so not like that mm-hmm. it's so not and sometimes you're just like wait where what am I doing right now like what did I what did I or you come into a scene and you're like all happy and then the director would be like no that um they just told you that you might be fired <laughs> the scene before you're like oh right 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 <laughs> you know and then you have to like shift your your approach at how you go but that's why you just got to keep like keep it mapped out you know when I get the when I know the scenes of a call sheet I have to go through the script and be like okay and then jot some notes down as to where I am um but that's like part of the fun yeah yeah it is really fun is there a part of producing that you loved that surprised you um yeah I think like the like the administrative things you know what I mean the getting all the contracts in order and you know, making sure that people were paid on time and all that stuff. I hated it, but it, but it did give me a great um, feeling of just like, you know, I'm helping these people get their paychecks and I'm help and I'm able to coordinate all these things. And these actors arrived here on time because I made that call in here and stuff like that. So I feel like because I'm naturally a creative person and I never have had a job besides like little, you know, contract things here and there, that have um, used that part of my brain. Mm -hmm. Uh, I actually like kind of really like dug it. I was surprised that I liked it. I don't know if I would be able to do it forever. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, I need to have creative uh, aspects of each job, but, uh, but I was really shocked that I really enjoyed arranging all the car rentals, you know, (laughs) 
<laughs> I was like, yeah, that's really cool. We're all picking up the cars tomorrow because I made that call. <laughs> I was like, that's right. You're all welcome. You know? um, and then, uh, the, you know, surprisingly, the part that I, I enjoyed the least was craft services, which is really shocking because I'm obsessed with cooking and food. And mm -hmm. I was... I was supposed to go to chef school and then I booked a theater gig and I did it. And I've always wanted to be in that world. So when I was going to do craft services, I was really into it. And then I hated it because I'm, I'm just like an, like I'm in my, my soul is like a 90 year old Italian mom, like grandmother. And so all I want to do is feed people and make them happy. And I was so stressed that people weren't enjoying their dinners and their snacks and things like that, that that was like, too, it was too overwhelming. <laughs> I was like, is it okay? Are you guys like, I wish we had something hot. I was like, I'm such an idiot. Like, you know, like I, like I was so stressed about it. I like, couldn't do it. I was like, I'm so, I just want people to be well fed. And the fact that like some of these snacks are subpar right now is really stressing me. <laughs> yeah. So I didn't like that. I think the administrative side of things makes us more of a well-rounded artist also because yeah. so many artists are living like so right brain thinking like everything but in order to actually like make things happen sometimes you have to have that business mindset as well yeah yeah and you can't do things on your own if you don't know how to do those things like mm -hmm. being creative and talented in that department only takes you so far mm -hmm. uh it makes you very hireable but it doesn't make you prepared to to create your own stuff mm -hmm. um, there's so many parts of it like even just putting on your own play at fringe that like 80 percent of that is is getting people to come see your play and marketing and you know making people aware of your show and stuff which is not always very creative it's pretty tedious and you know and and hard to do so having those skills is insanely helpful mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. even using social media like actually being consistent and showing up and making a post or timing it out or whatever it is. It's like, I'm so bad at that. <laughs> I'm so bad. I just like, I'm not good at it. <laughs> I'm not. And I don't like doing it. I don't like doing it. Cause I'm always just like, oh, that was, uh, is that a good post? Is that, uh, and then I just like, forget about it, you know? Um, but yeah, no, for sure. And, uh, and so I, uh, I'm really thankful that I learned those skills mm -hmm. on the job. At the, time, at the time, it felt like I was dr drowning, <clears throat> but now um, I'm like, I could do anything. Yeah. Like, I could really do anything. That was the hardest, that was truly the hardest thing I've ever done in this business. Um, and it was, um, at times it felt completely impossible. Mm -hmm. uh, and then at the end of it, we got a really cool movie that got it to South by Southwest this year. And, you know, um, is, is doing quite well and we're really excited to launch it fully and um, watching that film and being being like, there was so much that went into it besides what you see. Mm -hmm. And um, and yeah, I, I'm just really proud. Mm -hmm. I'm really proud of it. It's just you and you like push yourself and take chances and, you know, even the idea of, Education, obviously, there's a lot of things that you need school for, but you get this degree and then 20 years later, whatever you would have learned is probably irrelevant at this point. But we still put that importance on that piece of paper to say that we're qualified for this job. Yeah. But life experience, I think, and it's, just getting in there and doing it, like you said, can be the best education. For sure. So just believing in yourself rather than believe like, oh, I don't have the experience for it yet, but knowing that you have the capability to like learn and do it and pick it up. Yeah. And, and, and being okay, knowing that you're going to screw up. That's mm -hmm. the only, like the best lessons are learned by failure, you know? So being able to fail at that job, screwing up that first contract and an actor being like, Hey, I didn't get paid. I didn't screw up any more contracts. Yeah. I knew exactly what I needed to do, you know, but I needed to screw up the first one to, to keep going. And it's the same with acting. It's the same with any kind of art. Like, you only learn by, by making mistakes. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we're so afraid of that. We're so afraid of failure and we're so afraid of like getting in there and screwing up. But it's like, everyone does. That's part of it. That's, you know, and just because you're a good producer on a horror movie, doesn't mean you're going to be a good producer on a kid's show. You know, the, the, it's different. So it doesn't matter how qualified you are. You're never ready for this new job. I've mm -hmm. worked in a ton of bars and restaurants. Everyone is different. Yeah. You know, and every job is different, even though it's at the, at the end of the day, I'm shaking cocktails up mm -hmm. when you're working. How many seats did we have at our restaurant? Do you remember? I feel like 
one million. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, you know, doing that versus doing <clears throat> a small cocktail bar. Like that was a huge adjustment. Yeah. I could not keep up with you guys. Like I remember, first of all, I, I have to say, even doing this short, this um, horror film and it being so stressful, the most stressed I have ever been in my life has been brunch at Clooney chits dragging on the floor yeah. and like eight, eight servers being like, where are my drinks? Yeah. I literally, I could like die thinking about that. It was so stressful. Yeah, printer dream. Oh my God. All the time. That sound. Yeah. Oh my God. It like haunted me. Yeah. yeah. That was like, I, there were so many times I felt like getting up and leaving and it was always during those moments where you're just like, I'm disappointing all these people who are here at brunch trying to enjoy their time and all these servers who, you know, are relying on tips to survive and stuff like that. And they're all slowed down. They're all ready to go, but I can't get them drinks in time because there's so much to do because one table ordered 19 Marie Antoinette's. Do you remember that cocktail? <laughs> Holy. With the, with the, with the, what was it? Um, say that again. Cotton candy. Yes. Oh yeah. my God. When someone ordered one of those drinks, like when a table would order like 12 of them, I would just be like, kill, kill me now. Kill me right now. <laughs> Um, you know, or like, you know, so in those moments, I was so stressful, but what was your question? <laughs> what was your question? I feel like, I'm not sure actually, but I feel, like, <laughs> I feel like hospitality too, part of what made it such a good crash course in, in life, really. And when you talk about like sometimes just faking it, yeah, you really did just have to like keep going. There was no pause. There was no anything you had to keep going and you had to keep going like, Hi, you know what Absolutely. I mean? Like put that actor face on, yeah. put the persona on and just keep going no matter what. You have to, yeah. Make it I, the service was over. And then we all just sat in that room and just like complained. <laughs> about things. But um, when I started at Clooney, I had never worked. Um, I, had, I had worked a lot in bars and stuff like that, but it was a lot of wine and beer and not very cocktail focused mm -hmm. so when I got to Clooney I had like cheat sheets all over the place like hidden all over and like you know sometimes people would come in and ask me I remember um um I don't remember who it was which server it was came in and asked me to like just came in really quickly I got like a, a note because you guys would have to punch in things and if the cocktails weren't there you would have to make adjustments and I couldn't understand the note and she came and she was like, oh, we need uh, um, four last words. And I didn't know what that was. Mm -hmm. And I literally like faked like an, a crazy emergency pee. I was like, I'm so sorry. I really have to pee. And she's like, can you make the cocktails? Like, they, can you just make the cocktails? They've been waiting. I was like, no, I have to pee. I was like, I have to. And I ran out of that. I went to the bathroom like quickly like searched it because I didn't want to be like ratted out from being a, a fake. And I saw it and then I came back and I was like, so what was that? Four last words? <laughs> like super like casually grabbed it all. <laughs> yeah, I had a few of those. And Andrew, who was the manager at the time, I remember sometimes he'd come in and he'd be like, what are you doing? And I was like, oh, I'm making a Negroni. And he was like, why are you shaking it? And I was like, they asked for it that way. <laughs> and then I'd be like, yeah, I know. I thought that was weird too. And you gotta stir it, you gotta stir it. <laughs> Although Stanley Tucci just did one and he, that's been circulating. Did you see that? Which, sorry? You know, Stanley Tucci, the actor, he like no. posted a video of him like making a Negroni. Oh no. Like, lost her mind. And he shook it and I was like, ooh, Andrew would be pissed. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew would be pissed right now. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's so funny. Yeah. Um, how do you stay in like an imaginative flow state in general? Um, do you tend to kind of like come in and out? Yeah, I think so. I think so. But I think I'm always on the lookout for mm -hmm. ways to create and all of that. Like, I think that just is very natural to me. I don't think that it's very, it's hard for me to like sit down and do the work a lot of times, but I, I never have a problem living in that. I'm constantly daydreaming and thinking of ideas and looking at things in a way like, how can I do that? And how can I, that just comes really natural. I think if anything, my problem is, shutting that off and just being like, don't stop. Like you don't need to write your 20th script when you have like 10 others mm -hmm. that, that have like, that are begging to be written right now. Um, 
because I get so bored of things so quickly and I get so excited about other things and I'm just always like on the lookout for something else. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I think that just like comes very natural to me. Um, but yeah, I think my problem is like really sitting down and doing the work because mm -hmm. I love just talking about the work, you know, like I, I, some people are always like, you're so, um, you're such a go-getter and you work so hard and you're always working on things. And I'm like, I talk a big talk, I think. Like, I talk about how I'm working on things because I'm working on them in my head, but that doesn't mean that there's many words on that paper. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I just came up with this really cool idea for this movie and I have it all mapped out, but, like, I don't even have a title written on, on mm -hmm. the page, you know? So, yeah, it's easy for me to be creative up here. It's not so easy to be creative on the keyboard. Mm -hmm. For me, I feel like the up here part is the hard part. And oh, sometimes okay. I sit, not hard per se, but like, once I get the idea, doing that painting or curating that show is like yeah. a problem. It's like, I have to sit with the idea for so long. Right. And like, get it right. And, and it like, that's the part that takes a while. But it's once you get like to I'm, once you get yeah. to it, you're no problem. Yeah. Oh, I wish. So it could seem like I'm doing nothing, <laughs> but that's like the important part of the thinking yeah once that's done it's like okay let's make it happen oh cool that's so interesting have you ever um done any other kind of art like have you ever been an actor or anything like that or a dancer no no I played the sax actually for like nine years oh cool can you still play it uh I haven't in a long time but I'm missing it a lot oh cool I didn't think yeah, it's it's, I think it's so um it's so awesome when like artists have different different arts that they can access. I don't really have that, I guess besides writing. Uh, but you know, like I'm so not musical and I'm like, I can't draw to save my <laughs> life. Um, and I want to so badly. Like I want to be, I want to be, especially like music. Mm. I have like such a garbage voice and I, uh, and I can't, like I played the piano for like quite a few years and I, it's like, I never did. Like I when I see a piano, it's, I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, and I so badly wish, like when I see actors that are like that dance and sing and you know, you're like, must be, must be nice. <laughs> you know, must be nice to have all those skills. <laughs> it's funny that when you start to really think about it, like I said, no, initially, and then it's like, oh, but I played the sax. It's like, oh, well, I also sew. Oh, that's really cool. Cook. But when you start to like actually list up all the things, like creativity takes so many forms. True, true. Yeah, I didn't think about cooking. I'm adding that on my creative list. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you, you, you said you also like to cook? Yeah, I love cooking. I don't think I could ever like handle working in a kitchen. I agree. It's so, it like blows my mind the way they can remember all the elements of all the dishes that they're just contributing. It's crazy. It's, it's crazy. It's so stressful. Mm -hmm. Kitchens are so stressful. I think people who have never been in one would be shocked to see what happens yeah. in the kitchen. It's, they work so hard, those guys. Yeah, I don't, I think it would take the fun away from it for me, you mm -hmm. know? Um, I don't think I would enjoy it. Like now, now it's my favorite thing to do. I cook every day. I love it so much. I'm constantly making new things. I'm, I'm making, I, I don't know if you're, if you've been like everyone else in this pandemic, but I can't stop making breads. No. <laughs> like I made, I made the other week, I made like 200 Munchal bagels. I'm making pita bread tonight because we're having a little Greek feast. Um, and uh, I love it. I love it. But I, it, as soon as that becomes work, I don't think I would love it, yeah. you know? I'm not eating gluten right now, but I'm watching everyone else making bread and it's making me want to say like, screw it. Screw it. I just want the bread. <laughs> Go make some bread. Yeah. I know. It's crazy. I, I, it's crazy how uh, when I start, started making a lot of bread, I was like, I was like, why am I doing this? And then I saw social media. I was like, oh, everyone is doing this. We're all just making bread. <laughs> it's so funny. It's interesting. Like, Bread is actually one of the most beautiful art forms to me. And I learned that from working at Clooney, where for anyone that doesn't know, Clooney has a crazy like bread bar in the middle of the restaurant. And so they good. actually have like 
images of like a girl with a balloon or something on top of bread. It was like even just the basic loaf and the way it like splits in a certain way or like. Yeah, crazy. They're focaccia. Do you remember their focaccia? Yeah. Oh, I remember we used to, I don't know if I ever did this with you, but I, me and like uh, servers would make like deals <laughs> where they, cause, cause you guys always wanted like a mocktail or something to drink that was like, that would keep you going. Yeah. So we would always get those like, you know, can you make me something fun without alcohol? Obviously, obviously for everybody that's listening. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I'd be like, yes, if you can sneak me <laughs> a basket of focaccia and yeah. all the butter, cause the butter yeah. was amazing too. I know. Oh, that was the best part. <laughs> it was. I mean, you like working with you guys was cool too, but <laughs> the focaccia was there for the bread. Yeah, <laughs> we all were. We were all there for the bread. <laughs> and taking it home at the end of the night if you closed. Yes. Yeah. Perks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you need them. Um, well, before we wrap up, what yeah. advice would you give to aspiring actors? Oh. I guess who are struggling with their flow and struggling to stay in like a creative headspace. I would say um, the first thing is this is an insanely competitive business and there are so many of us trying to do this and we all have different, um, you know, different uh, experiences and we all, to, to me, this didn't come easy. I struggled for a really, really long time before I was able to, even pay a bill as an actor, you know what I mean? Um, and then I know some people that graduate from school and book a lead on a TV show. Mm-hmm. Because everyone has a different experience in it. And I think our job as actors is to be like, you know, we have to accept that that's just how it goes, but we have to keep doing everything we can to increase our chances. And I think the ways of doing that is A, being the best you can, so like I still train to this day. I'm always taking acting classes because you, you're never done learning. Um, so being the best you can be. So when the opportunity presents itself, that you're ready for it, mm-hmm. creating your own work, because especially in the beginning, it's the best way to get people to see you um, is by putting your work out there and letting people see it and do that play and that short film and all that stuff. And then my advice that I always give um, because I think it's the most important and I think it's often overlooked is just being a really good person and being kind. Mm-hmm. Um, because I believe that, you know, with Kim's convenience, I think that I'm hoping that my talent was what got them to keep calling me back. But I also think it was that I showed up on that set and I learned everybody's names and I, and I made sure to be really respectful and kind and not waste anybody's time and be there and be a pleasure to have on that set. And people want that. People want to work with people that are nice and that are kind. And I think, um, you know, we often don't think about that, but like there are so many moving parts to creating a show. There are like a hundred crew members that work, no offense to us actors, way harder than we work. They're there first thing in the morning and they leave last. And they don't get the, the praise that we, don't, we get. They don't get the Twitter messages about like, thank you so much for doing what you do. You know, they, they don't, people don't even know that they're a part of the show. They do it because they love filmmaking so much. And those people deserve just as much respect and kindness as the director and the producer. And I think people tiptoe around act- actors a lot because, um, you know, they need us to be our best so that the final product is the best. But everyone if everyone is kind to everyone and everyone is working together, that's when you create the best work. Mm -hmm. So don't be an asshole. Be nice to people. Like when you go to parties and you meet other directors and actors and stuff, be kind, ask people about what they're doing. And eventually they, you guys will, you know, they will call you for that thing and you'll get called in for that other thing. And when you call them in, they'll do you a solid, Mm -hmm. but you're, if you're selfish and you do this on your own, it's not going to, it's not going to work out, you know? So yeah, that's my advice. As a curator, that definitely rings true for me. You know, yeah. it's like, I I say often, like, talent is not rare. And yeah. social media has really shown us how many incredible artists there are out there and we can access each other. Um, and so, like, I don't want to work with 
divas. <laughs> why, why would you? No. you know? Why? Like, why would anyone? Yeah. Yeah. There are so many, like you said, so, so many artists out there. Why, why would I waste my time with someone who is just, you know, a sourpuss yeah. and, you know, complains and all that stuff. Like, listen, we all have our shit that we're dealing with, mm-hmm. but when we come to the work itself, just show up and be a, just, it's not hard. It's not hard to be a good person and be kind. And if you're feeling bad, then take a breath and go outside and, you know, of course we're all frustrated, but especially when I see, when I see people taking it out on people that shouldn't have to deal with, you know, their shit, that's like, that really boils my blood. And luckily like on Kim's Convenience, it, it, every, not only are the actors so beautiful and kind, the crew is so invested in the show as well that everybody is working in it all together. There's no, it doesn't feel like there are tears or anything like that. We're kind of all in it together. It's like, it's such a beautiful thing to see. And, and I think that's part of the reason why our show is so successful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love that. Well, yeah. thank you so much for joining me. Yeah. Thank you for having me. This is fun. This time. Um, yeah. How can people find you or connect with you? Well, listen, I'm really bad at social media, but if you want to see a post every six weeks, uh, you can go on uh, my name at Michael Moosey at Twitter and Instagram. Uh, I don't have TikTok because I don't understand it. Uh, <laughs> and I feel like I'm too old, but um, I feel like it's now, I'm, I'm a little upset because it's like now I feel like older people are now using it more and more and more. And I'm like, I think, is it going to come to a point where I have to get a TikTok account? What am I going to do? <laughs> Me too. <laughs> so, so don't go on TikTok. Okay. Uh, but yeah, that's where you can find me on Twitter and Instagram. And uh, you can watch Kim's Convenience on Netflix or on CBC Gem, wherever you are. Dang. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, that was our episode. I have to say that last bit of advice sums up exactly why we love Michael so much. How amazing would it be if everyone lived by those same standards of kindness and respect for all of our co-creators? Be sure to follow Michael. And again, if you haven't subscribed or liked our videos, please show us some love. Share it with your friends. Thanks for listening, everyone. Until next time.